Welcome to the Showcase Virtual Scavenger Hunt using online tools to facilitate collaboration and social engagement. My name is Annetta Quack. And I'm Jeff Newman, and we're both librarians at the DG Ivy Library at New College at the University of Toronto. This presentation will show how we used online tools to reimagine what a scavenger hunt would look like in an accessible online space, while preserving the opportunity for students to get to know each other, collaboratively work on a challenge, and get feedback. We will provide some background context and explain the original scavenger hunt, then go into the 2020 virtual scavenger hunt, describing the preparation, the tools we used, what we did, some outcomes, and things to consider. Then we'll wrap up with some closing remarks. For some context, DG Ivy Library is a small academic library in the larger University of Toronto library system. We primarily support new college students or students enrolled in new college programs and courses, which are primarily social sciences and humanities based. During orientation week, our library participates in the planning and delivery of a one-day academic orientation program called IGNITE in partnership with the New College Writing Centre and Office of Student and Resident Life to help students with the academic transition from high school to university. The library has one hour to introduce incoming students to resources and services available in the library. In 2019, we developed a scavenger hunt as part of the library's component for IGNITE. Students were provided with a list of citations and asked to find the items listed in the different library collections in order to gather puzzle pieces that were hidden inside the physical items. The list of citations was meant to replicate a reading list and contain different kinds of materials, including journal articles, books, chapters and anthologies, encyclopedia entries, short stories, conference proceedings, poems and collections, etc. Once each group had all the puzzle pieces, they would have a map of the library that would lead them to a hidden treasure. Participants operated in groups of five to six to compete to win the prize. Students were able to learn how to use the library catalog, find material in the library, locate books on course reserve, and how to check out books. This program was held in person in the library, and students were able to explore the library as a place on campus, the collections in the library, and meet the librarians in person, all while having fun. And then it was 2020, and time to run Orientation Week again. When Orientation Week rolled around this year, we find ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic. Social distancing was in full effect, and our students were scattered around the world, and we could not provide in-person programming. The library was faced with the challenge of developing a program that could provide students with the skills and information that would be useful to them in their first few weeks of class. We had to think creatively about how we could maintain the key elements of the previous programming while in an online environment. We also wanted to ensure that at the end of the session, students wouldn't look back and say, this could have been a YouTube video. The focus on working with reading lists was important to us because it helped prepare students for tracking down the readings they would need in the first few weeks of their classes, and is a key skill that they could use very early in their university career. It would give us the chance to introduce them to how to use the university's authentication system, UTOR ID, give them exposure to library resources like the library catalog and the Hathi Trust Emergency Temporary Access System, and of course, learn how to read a citation and understand the elements of the citation that would make it the easiest to find the resource online. Something we hope will help on the other side too when they actually have to cite the sources. It was just as important to us that the students have something active to do and that we preserve the social connection that comes from having students work on something collaboratively as a team. So what tools did we use? The tools that we used to make this happen were Zoom, which you're probably familiar with. That allowed us to host the video call with the registered students who were sent a URL with a passcode to join the session. We used Zoom's share screen feature, which allowed us to share PowerPoint slides and closed captions. The Zoom breakout rooms gave the students a collaborative space where they could work together with their cameras and their microphones on. And we used PowerPoint from Office 365 and its automatic closed captioning feature to provide accessibility for hearing impaired attendees as well as English language learners who may have been participating. 
We use Microsoft Word in Office 365 to allow students to collaboratively edit documents, and we used OneDrive as a platform for distributing and collecting all of the completed worksheets. Before the session, we put together a reading list of material that would either be available online, through our curbside pickup program, or through the Hathi Trust Emergency Temporary Access Program. This would give the students the experience of finding and accessing a variety of content from several different sources. What we did. We started the session with a quick introductory component using PowerPoint with the subtitles feature turned on. We introduced ourselves as the librarians and some key components of the library website. We then introduced the New College Orientation and Reading List Challenge, aka the Virtual Scavenger Hunt. We explained how the challenge works and shared a PDF with instructions with students as well. We also shared a link to a OneDrive folder that contained Word documents for each breakout room. We explained how to use the Ask for Help button in Zoom as well. We then moved students into breakout rooms. Students were asked to open Word documents with the number that corresponded to their breakout room so that they could all collaboratively edit the documents together. For each item on the list, students had to find and access or download an online copy of the article, book, or chapter, etc. Students would use the color-coded citation handout to decipher the citations in the reading list and identify the most appropriate tools to use to locate the items. To complete this task, they would have to use the library catalog, log into resources using their UTOR ID, navigate interfaces from different vendors like JSTOR and ProQuest, as well as the Hathi Trust. To prove they found each item on the list of citations, they had to make a screenshot and paste it into the shared document. The requirement to prove they had found the item was listed on the worksheet. We provided resources on how to take screenshots on various devices as well. Students worked as a team to collect and locate the resources and capture screenshots. Students were also encouraged to use the Ask for Help button in Zoom to get help from a librarian. One librarian would move into a room that needed assistance and then return to a main room until another group needed help. We wanted to build in help-seeking practices and behaviors so that students developed a comfort level asking for help instead of struggling in silence. Students were given 40 to 45 minutes to complete the activity and then brought back together for a debrief. So what were the outcomes from this session? We don't have access to all the final tabulated data yet, but one of the things that we experienced in the session was students reporting back that finding the readings on their reading list was harder than they expected it to be, and that they were appreciative that we were able to provide strategies to help them navigate that complexity. We also had the upper year peer leaders who are participating in the sessions comment that they learned a lot of new things from these workshops as well, which was very gratifying to hear. There are also some things to consider. The first thing is to make sure that you have help available. We had assistance from members of the team from the Office of Residence and Student Life helping us to run this session, dealing with things in the chat and other little administrative and technical things that came up along the way. You're so busy teaching during these sessions that handling those things can be a little unmanageable. Also, plan for accessibility. We paid a lot of attention to make sure that closed captions were a part of our session. We also made sure that our Word documents were accessible, incorporating alt text and headings. Even where we used color in the APA handout, the text was constructed in such a way that even a colorblind user or a student on a screen reader could still get the full meaning of the text. Even the activity was structured in a way that all students could contribute, even if some tasks, like taking screenshots, would be difficult for an individual student. Also, if you plan on using tools like Google Drive or OneDrive, be sure to enable editing or have a quick way to quickly enable editing for documents or resources being shared. We assumed that if we set the permissions for the whole folder to editable, that everything inside the folder would be able to be edited by the students. It turned out that this wasn't the case, and we had to go through document by document, adjusting the privileges and providing each group with a new URL for the document that they had to edit. Some groups moved faster than we could get the new documents, and they came up with their own solution for submitting their results, which was wonderful to see. This activity was grounded in something practical, but the group nature of the activity allowed the students, who were spread all over the world, 
to work with four or five other incoming students on something collaborative while using tools and resources that will help them with their studies, all while having fun. Like so many people in higher education, this session was one of our first attempts at online teaching. We worked to make a session that was engaging, fun, collaborative, social, and accessible to a diverse community of participants. We were able to identify and leverage features of several different tools to reduce the distance between 120 incoming students who couldn't get together on campus. Hi, thank you for attending. My name is Nicole Eva. I'm a librarian at the University of Lethbridge in Lethbridge, Alberta. The University of Lethbridge is a liberal education institution, and the library has been involved in the delivery of the first year liberal education course for about the past 15 years, the past 12 of which I've led. The four library labs I hold for the Liberal Education 1000 course are traditionally very interactive. They are, they start with about a 15 or 20 minute lecture, but most of the class is based in a discussion or practical activity. The four labs cover the six ACRL frames for information literacy in higher education to greater and lesser degrees. With the courses going online, it was a struggle to, to reimagine how to do this in a virtual world. Then I discovered the power of the Zoom breakout room. Each class is a bit different, so these rooms have been utilized in a variety of ways. In the first lab, classes are usually, the class is usually broken into groups of four or five, and each group discusses various iterations of a research question and decides which is the best version, the most researchable version of a question. Then we come back together as a large class to discuss and, and debate the best question. This was fairly easy, easily accomplished by placing these same students into virtual breakout rooms in where they discussed and then we came back to report. Sometimes I would pop into the groups and some of them were dark, um, but most of them, if they didn't have their cameras on, at least were talking with the audio on or at the very least were using the chat function to discuss and debate these questions. And at least one person from each group was willing to speak um, when we came back together as the larger group. In the second lab, I have students complete a search worksheet. So I provide a variety of topics and, or if they, they can choose their own topic as well. And then they have to search our various resources uh, for a number of items. So they search our discovery layer, they search the library catalog, subject specific databases and Google Scholar just to see the variety of resources that they can get from each one. And I have them record the various things that they can find. Normally this class is held in a computer lab and I can circulate around the room as they're working on their worksheets and answer any questions that come up and then re-clarify things to the entire class. So if it's clear that there are questions coming over and over, I can go back up to the front of the class and re-demonstrate. Or if I realize I've forgotten to say something, I can reiterate that. So, in the virtual world, I had the class split in two and I had the assistance of a colleague. Um, so we were in two, two breakout rooms basically, each, each half of the class and my colleague was with one half and I was with the other. So that we had a slightly smaller group, which we thought might uh, allow the students to feel a bit more comfortable chatting with us and talking about questions that they might have. Um, in reality, I think there were far fewer questions than have I had I been circling the room, looking over their shoulders and sort of guiding them that way because of course they're all working individually on their screens and and I can only help them if they pipe up and ask me. So in that sense I'm not certain it worked quite as well virtually as it did in person. The third lab is all about evaluation. So I provide them with two different articles in which they're supposed to investigate uh, various things about it decide how trustworthy they are. So they look at the author, they look at the references, they look at the writing style, they look at the source, and they decide which article, if any, are good articles, good uh, quality articles. So again, I broke the class into two groups. Uh, one half of the group was with a colleague and the other half of the group was with me. 
and we would discuss in these slightly smaller groups uh, what what the various merits of each article were. This worked pretty well in both my groups and my colleagues groups. Uh, we both tended to have about three to five people dominating the conversation out of say the 20 but um, that tends to happen in person as well and usually this discussion happens as one large group discussion in the actual physical classroom so having it half and half I think actually may have allowed more people to speak and then again we came back together as one larger group in the end and my colleague and I sort of pointed out the various items that our that our groups had come up with. The fourth lab is normally a citation competition so I would normally provide photocopied um, examples of resources, so a book chapter, uh, uh, academic article, a website, an encyclopedia article, a magazine article, various things that they have to identify what the resource is and then be able to cite it correctly in APA. In the virtual world, I really didn't know how to do this. Also in, in person, they're then running to the whiteboard to be the first group to correctly record their citation. Um, so in the virtual world, I thought, well, what, I wasn't sure what to do, but then I realized I could create a Google Doc and have them all contribute to the same document. So I put links to the various resources, again, a variety of different types of resources that they would have to A, figure out what type of resource it was, and then B, compile a correct citation in APA style. So once again, I put them in breakout rooms, but each breakout room had their own corresponding uh, link on the Google Doc that they would then follow, determine, and cite. And they would put the citation right on that shared Google Doc. This actually worked very well. And in fact, I think it's something that I will retain even when we go return to in-person because sometimes the whiteboard got a bit crowded and awkward. So I think it was kind of nice to have everybody contribute to a shared document within their own little groups. And that way we could see who's done and, and work on it together and go over the results together. We could all see them quite clearly. The move to online also provided me an opportunity to rethink the assessment elements for this, these labs. I have 8% of the students' final grades to do with as I wish. And the assessments over the years have changed. The last few years, it's been reflection assessment assessments. Every week, the students have to write a reflection on that week's lab, um, things that surprised them, things that confused them, things that reminded them of other elements in their life, whatever it was, it, an in-depth reflection every week. Um, so those four reflections made up their 8%. This year, with the new format, I decided to change it up a bit and utilize some of the online elements that we, we could take advantage of. So for example, the search worksheet they normally do in class is not worth any marks, but this time I actually had them handed in for um, some marks. They also had to contribute to a forum posting on examples of good and bad information about COVID-19 that they could find online um, and explain why. They also had an online Moodle quiz, just a short uh, four question worth 1% Moodle quiz on APA. And then their final reflection, summing up all four weeks of the labs. And again, what, what surprised them? What was a light bulb moment? What they still confused about? What they appreciated or didn't appreciate about the labs? And reflect on that for just 2% this time. So those four elements make up their 8%. And I actually really like the variety. I think it's more interesting for the students. It's more interesting for me as a marker. And I actually think it probably serves a better pedagogical purpose with the variety of things that they can use to contribute to that 8% assessment. So overall levels of engagement have been very good with these labs um, and feedback has been very positive as well. The move to online has really been a great opportunity for me to rethink many of the lab elements and ensure that they're for a reason and that they're serving the best purpose um, in those classes. So far from being a detriment, I would say that moving online has actually improved the quality of these labs and will, I will definitely retain some of the changes going forward. Thanks very much for your time. Hi, I'm Sasha, a learning strategist at Centennial College. Hi, my name is Cindy. I'm a senior learning center technician, also from Centennial. 
In this video, we'll be presenting on the role and impact of the new Libraries and Learning Centers Promotions and Events Committee in the new online post-secondary environment. We'll share with you how we came about, some of our initiatives, what we've learned along the way, and where we're headed next. Hope you enjoy the presentation. At Centennial, each student travels a hero's journey in pursuit of academic success. With a presence at each of Centennial's five campuses, the library has always served as a safe haven for students, a mentor or guide towards the necessary knowledge for success. It was Gandalf for Frodo, Dumbledore for Harry, and at Centennial, it is the libraries and learning centers. However, at the start of this year, when disaster struck and our spaces were closed, we were unable to reach our heroes in the same way. Our library technicians were still offering frontline research and reference support over chat. Our librarians were still providing access to excellent online resources through our LibGuides, and our learning and math strategists were offering personalized support through Skype and Discord appointments. But with so many different service platforms, we could no longer take a passive role in trusting that students would find us along their journey. We needed a way to bring all of these different perspectives together, to define our voice and light the spark in the dark a way to collaborate and ensure that our students don't lose their way so they can rise up and be the heroes they need to be. And so we formed, what else? A working group, dubbed the Promotion and Events Committee. The group started small, but eventually it grew to incorporate voices from different campuses and roles. And we now have representation from librarians, learning strategists, and library technicians. So how does a group with different points of view come together and collectively find a way to reach our students? From a lot of brainstorming and open discussions, we realized there was one resounding theme. The library is an epicenter of help and student support. And so for us, setting our motto, we're here to help, was a no-brainer. We now had something to anchor our messaging to and help drive what we wanted students to know. We could light our beacon of reassurance and send the call out to students that we are still here to support them like before, but now only remotely and online. One of the challenges of being off-site is not being able to interact with students in person and work with them to find out what they need. To overcome this, we needed a different way to engage with students, and so we took on our biggest project of creating a series of videos highlighting how to navigate the library's online environment, from demonstrating how to search summons to simply how to contact the library. Although we had a steep learning curve ahead of us, but a lot of enthusiasm, we all jumped in and worked together to develop the skills for video creation, like scripting, screencasting, narration, and editing. Through knowledge sharing and collaborative learning, we all seem to naturally develop our own niche skills and continue to define our roles based on skill set. Who knew that Ben, our narrator with the golden voice, could have an alternate career in radio? One affirming sign that students were hearing us was when we launched the Grab and Go book service in the fall of 2020. The committee's promotional video played a crucial role in helping students learn about the service and how to use it. From here, with many thanks to our resident YouTuber Adler, we found a home for our new videos on our YouTube channel. Collaborating with the librarians, the videos were also incorporated into relevant LibGuides, as well as other points of access on our website. Students who are accessing the library online for the first time, or students searching for valuable resources, can now access this information anytime, anywhere on their e-learning journey. Aside from video creation, our committee also took on the challenge of online programming and events for the library and worked our promotional chops. As a group, we positioned ourselves as the conduit to push out promotional ideas for library-centric initiatives and add our voice to college-wide events such as Science Literacy Week, Orange Shirt Day, and most recently Holocaust Education Week. This really gave us the opportunity to extend our voice beyond the library, increase collaboration with other departments, and create new channels to promote through. How do we do this? Working directly with other college areas, we coordinated efforts and leveraged strengths to further our goals. For example, we now work directly with the college's social media team and leverage their Instagram experience and online following by providing them with focused library content. 
Programming and events planning also gave us the chance to combine several of our platforms into one concerted effort. Our libguides became virtual book displays, we expanded our video creation to include promotional powtoons, and created interactive virtual presentations using Google Sheets. By expanding our traditional platforms to the digital world, we reinforced our online presence through promotional and events-driven waypoints in students' learning journeys. This opens up different paths and allows them to gain new perspectives and ideas to expand their student experience. Overall, all of these experiences have led us to keep consistency of messaging as front of mind across all library teams and activities. A lot of what we've highlighted so far in this video showcases our end results, but behind the scenes was the necessary work of planning, strategizing, and learning. We have always kept our work for the committee as a fairly organic process and allowed it to grow as it needs. Simply working together, following established guidelines and processes while keeping our messaging consistent. By staying true to our messaging and working off our slogan, we're here to help, we have slowly started to include the signal into our overall branding, starting with our videos, to our website, and now into our promotional materials. As part of our mid-semester push for students, we incorporated wellness kits to our grab-and-go service that also includes inspirational bookmarks with our slogan. So what's next for the LLC Promotions and Events Committee? Well, as students continue to navigate and learn in an online world, the library and learning centers will be there as the ever-present knowledge mentor. Our motto, we're here to help, is the truth and guiding light that we have always worked from and will continue to, regardless of where we are. And not only are we here to help students, but through this committee, we have learned a greater lesson, that we are also here to help and support each other. In our collective role as knowledge guides, we will continue our efforts to keep the torch lit by creating more online content, hosting new online events, and being the light in the dark when students need us most. Centennial Libraries, we're here to help. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning into our e-learning showcase, Articulate Rise 360 to design self-paced online modules in the health sciences. My name is Michaela Gray and I'll be presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Caitlin Fuller and Glenniva bradley Rideout. We are all liaison and education librarians at the Gerstein Science Information Center at the University of Toronto. A quick disclaimer before we get started, none of us are e-learning experts at all and we're not paid by Articulate Rise 360. We're just a group of librarians who've used Articulate Rise 360 for numerous projects since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we've had very positive experiences. With the rapid movement to online as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw most courses at our institution move online, using a combination of fully synchronous, fully asynchronous, and flipped classroom learning. We, like most others, were faced with the challenge of quickly determining if, and how we could continue offering popular open registration workshop series, as well as adapt course integrated information literacy instruction in this new online environment. We're big fans of using active learning in our instruction and integrate it into almost all in-person teaching. We knew we wanted to find a way to continue to do so if possible. We are also aware that students have been under a significant amount of added stress as a result of the shift to online learning, Many are trying to balance school with responsibilities at home or work, and many are experiencing Zoom fatigue, all which may impact their ability to participate and engage fully during synchronous sessions. So we sought out a platform that could help us quickly build interactive and enjoyable modules. At the same time, as health science librarians, we wanted to build something to help our community consume the rapidly evolving evidence on COVID-19 and understand how it differs from the typical evidence landscape in medical literature. We began to explore available tools and landed on Articulate Rise 360. Our first experience working with the tool was developing our open module called Navigating the COVID-19 Evidence Landscape. This module was built collaboratively by a team of four librarians and one library school student using a free trial of the resource. So what is Articulate Rise 360? It's a web-based tool that allows you to quickly and easily design responsive, interactive, and beautiful online asynchronous modules. Articulate Rise 360 allows you to create courses containing multiple lessons. 
Within each lesson, you can design and display your content by embedding images, videos, and using pre-made blocks, such as interactive images, accordion boxes, flip cards, and much more. Articulate Rise is one component of the Articulate Rise 360 suite, which also includes Articulate Storyline. Since April 2020, we've used Articulate Rise 360 to design two primary types of modules. The first is open modules for our community and beyond. This includes our COVID-19 module, which is openly available online. It's also been cited on Wikipedia, shared with faculty and included on syllabi, shared on social media and retweeted by large organizations such as the Cochrane Collaboration. The second is modules for curricular and non-curricular integrated instruction. We've designed a series of modules for our three-week open registration workshop series on searching for knowledge syntheses. This workshop series uses a flipped classroom approach where students are asked to complete a set of modules before attending the live synchronous sessions so that class time can be reduced to lessen Zoom fatigue. We've also used this flipped classroom approach with Articulate Rise 360 module pre-work for a four credit course and several curriculum embedded lectures. Finally, we've also designed standalone modules to replace curriculum embedded instruction for courses that have been converted to completely asynchronous delivery. As much as we loved working with Articulate Rise 360, there were several obstacles that we had to work through. The first obstacle was cost. We used free 60-day trials to design our COVID-19 module and to begin building some additional modules. While the free trial provides access to all features associated with a subscription-based account, if you don't begin a paid subscription by the end of your free trial, you do lose access to your modules unless you export them. And exported files are not easily editable outside of Articulate Rise 360 unless you know HTML or CSS. The paid subscriptions are also fairly expensive with academic pricing ranging from 649 American dollars per user per year for team licenses to 499 American dollars per year for individual user licenses. The second obstacle is related to hosting. Articulate Rise 360 does not provide long-term hosting for modules designed using the tool. Instead, you need to identify an external place to host your content or pay Articulate's additional hosting fee. There are three export options, web, which allows you to turn your module into a website, PDF, which expands all content such as accordion boxes, therefore losing all interactivity, and learning management systems, which allow you to upload your module and embed it within your LMS. We've used a combination of these three export types, depending on the situation and needs. Our institution was able to create web pages to host our open module, as well as some of our curriculum integrated modules. We've also embedded some modules within our LMS for select curriculum integrated and open workshops. While we did like our ability to host modules within our LMS, it took a lot of time and experimentation to determine the best way to do this. There are a variety of LMS export types. Depending on export type, the module will either appear in a new pop-out window or embedded within the LMS page, as you can see here. Some export types also allow the gathering of click count data for the module. Figuring out which LMS export type made sense for us was a learning curve, and this will vary based on preference, needs, and the function of your specific LMS. So we encourage you to explore the different options to determine what might work best for you. We've also used the PDF export option to provide somewhat accessible versions of the modules as a supplement to embedding them within our LMS. This is not a perfect solution as all interactivity is lost and the functionality of any embedded media content is also lost. This brings us to our third obstacle, which was accessibility and screen reader integration. Currently, RISE 360 courses don't fully support screen readers. However, the company does say that they're working on this functionality. Uh, so providing access to PDF versions alongside our modules where applicable was the best solution that we could identify at the time, though it is definitely far from ideal. In addition to the challenges that we faced, there are also many things that we really love about Articulate Rise 360. First, it's incredibly easy to use and incredibly easy to create aesthetically pleasing modules using built-in content blocks. 
This makes the learning curve for this tool very low. These built-in design blocks include options for embedding interactivity, such as accordion boxes, interactive images, continue buttons to switch lessons, and knowledge checkers in the form of multiple choice questions, flip cards, and matching exercises. You can also add blocks that enable embedding of media, such as videos or linking out to other resources. This is an example of some of the blocks that are available in Articulate Rise 360. And this is an example of a knowledge checker that we used in one of our modules, uh, a flip card knowledge checker. And here's an example of video integration within one of our modules. These opportunities for interactivity keep things engaging for users as it breaks up any walls of text by displaying them in ways that stimulate interest and forces the user to click around in the module instead of just skimming the text. We've also received a lot of positive feedback from students about the design and presentation of content in modules created using Articulate Rise 360. They found the modules to be engaging, interesting, and visually appealing. As well, as col as well collaboration was relatively seamless. When using the free trial or the team-based education license, multiple team members can work on the same project at once, though only one person can work on a lesson within a module at a time. It's also possible for multiple individuals to be logged into a single account at once with the individual education license, as long as they're editing different modules. It's not possible for multiple collaborators to work on the same module at the same time with this license. It's also very easy to share courses and lessons that you've created with other RISE 360 users so that they can reuse or adapt them. If you have any questions about our experiences using Articulate RISE 360, please feel free to reach out. We've also provided links for several modules here on the slide uh, that we've created using the tool over the last several months, and we're happy to share more for on, further on request. Thank you for turning in, tuning into our e-learning showcase.